but I'm the host, so let me talk. You're live. Yeah. All right, we're live now. Three, two, one. Welcome to the Zorich Podcast, everybody. Uh, tonight we have a very special guest, uh, someone I've known for ah over thirty years. It's kind of scary. Uh, former Notre Dame or Notre Dame alum, uh, national champion, and partner in No Brew Coffee Company, which we'll we'll actually talk about a little later. Uh, we're we're going to talk about kind of Michael Stobreaker and his illustrious career at Notre Dame. Hey, <laughs> thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me on. It's good to see you, brother. I love you. And uh, I'm excited to spend some time with you. Well, thank you very much. I, I do want to thank you publicly for moving your, your date for me because uh, we, we wound up having, you were supposed to be on a week ago, but uh, we we're actually waiting to see if we can get Cole Komet, but he had to, uh, uh, he's, he's going to be, uh, I'm sorry, he just left Notre Dame. He was uh, the Bears' top pick, and he actually has to go to training camp. So that's the reason why I was able to – you were kind enough to let me bump you back, which I got several text messages, and I felt terrible about it. So thank you. Yeah, that's fine, Chris. As I said, I'll be your David Spade. You know, you can hold me in the, <laughs> in the background each week. If somebody uh, bails on you, I'll just slide right in, and I'll be there for you. You are the best, Michael. You are the best. So – this is kind of fun for me because uh, a lot of folks don't know. I'm going to start off a little bit, but we're, we're going to talk about kind of growing up in New Orleans, uh, your dad playing for New Orleans, uh, how, how really cool that was. Uh, but before we start, um, when your sophomore year, you were rooming with Andy or did Andy pull us in? How did that work when we were in that the store? was in Soren Hall, it was small, I think maybe the smallest dorm. It was the, uh, the oldest dorm. Oldest dorm. The With Soren no, Hall, no Soren refrigeration. Hall, Soren Hall screaming otters, man. We were there you the go. Otter, oh, the, the, nice. <laughs> the otter uh, pride. Uh, they had the turret rooms on the corners. And right. if you had a turret room, you had an extra room connected to that. And so the 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 goal for everybody was at one point to get one of those larger turret uh turret rooms and so uh yeah i think that was my sophomore year no i think it was a, wait i forgot what year it was we no nah, that was your junior year my junior year because well yeah. who did you where did you live your freshman year were you in soren yeah i was on the third floor did you have a single the, did you have a roommate i had a roommate uh and then he left uh, halfway through the season, so I was uh, had a single for the rest of the season. Nice. Okay. Yeah, All right. Well, because I remember, uh, I think Andy pulled both of us in, or all three of us, because we had uh, Kent Graham was my roommate. Yeah. And so I, I well, think I was he had the top pick. Yeah, I think I was there with uh, for the year before you guys with uh, Marty Lippincott yes. and Andy yes. Heck. That's right. And, and myself. And so we had a year right. together there <laughs> and had a, had a, you know, enjoyed the, some good study time and, and had a good yes. system set up for, uh, for that. And so we, I think we back, we back ended you guys into that situation. <laughs> but having that extra room, that turret room, the spread out, you know, was, was, was priceless. That was awesome. Man. And, and, and so how did you guys get in? Because my understanding was that Soren was like, at least for, for the athletes, it was like this very prestigious dorm. It was, a, it, it actually was where the college started. Um, and the only way I got pulled in was because Kent Graham was a quarterback. And I think Andrew Zach was in the dorm. Um, Burline was in the dorm. Burline was in there. Before you got there. Right, right. So there were a whole bunch of quarterbacks over there. So, how did you get pulled in there? Were, were you considered one of the elite for Holtz? Into the, into the dorm or into yeah, the turret into the, room? Into the dorm. No, I just, I think they just, you know, just, they were just throwing numbers out. I have no idea how they put me in there. They figured I was <laughs> small enough not to take up any room, I guess. Wow. But 
you know, being in Thorn, you met a lot of guys, a lot of great guys. Uh, you know, it was a good, small dorm. Everybody looked out for each other, and we had a lot of fun in Thorn. Well, and I think what was interesting for, for those folks listening who might not know about Soren, uh, first of all, it's right across, it's like a, a stone's throw from the, the church, which is great, but it was kind of weird because the president lived in the dorm. Lived in the dorm, and on Sunday mornings when the church bells rang, they rang right outside of your window, so there was no sleeping in on uh, Sunday morning. So, <laughs> yeah, you'd walk by and... Um, you know, you'd see him in the hallway, say, hey, how's it going? You know, how are you doing? I generally try to keep on moving and, yes. and, and yes. hopefully not be noticed too much. Correct. But, I, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know if that happens now. But I remember back in the day, I thought it was, it was crazy that the president lived, like, literally down the hall. I don't know. That's why, uh, that's why we had such uh, good times in Torrance because we knew – if we did get in a little, you know, cause a little bit of trouble, you could stumble, go down the hall and, and beg for forgiveness if you had Stumble to. down the hall, right? Well, I, I, I cut that. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, so you come from a great tradition of football players in your family. So your dad played the NFL for a little bit. Um, one, how was that growing up as a kid? But also, like, were you pressured to play – Football, how did you kind of get involved in football? Actually, uh, my father was good. The high school I went to, John Curtis Christian School, uh, my head coach's record right now is something like 598 wins, uh, 18 losses, and wow. seven ties over the last, you know, 40 Jeez. years. And so uh, – they run the Veer offense and they teach fundamentally sound football. Okay. And so I went there, started going there in sixth grade. And so uh, my father held me out of, of, of playground um, football. He thought the skeleton didn't need to uh, take that beating. You know, your muscles aren't developed. There's no sure. reason to do that. You know, some of these uh, playground coaches don't teach the best, best techniques. And so he wanted me to wait till seventh, eighth grade, you know, to where you get a little muscle on your body before you start uh, absorbing and or, you know, giving contact. And so, you know, he never pressured me into it uh, at all. And once I was in John Curtis's system, he had faced with the, with the coaches and let, you know, the game had changed since he had played. So right. he let them, let them coach and he had faith in them and they knew what they were doing. Cause as I said, uh, you know, this was in the, in the eighties, they would go to the LSU camps. They would go, uh, you know, to all the college camps around and learn from the coaches, you know, it's kind of like when they were just started doing those coaching clinics and all that. So they would bring us straight back and they would teach us fundamentally sound football. And so, you know, started in seventh and eighth grade, and that's all you knew. So you didn't know to cross your legs or get out of position. All you <laughs> right. knew was how to do it the right way. And uh, and being in from New Orleans, uh, my father was drafted. He was on the original Saints team. So wow. back then in 1967, they took two players from each team across the league. So oh, they were, you know, okay. they would give away all their older, you know, guys who are on the way out. So it's like <laughs> you know, Jim Taylor and uh, you know, my father and, uh, you know, all the old school guys that, that were getting old. So they all were veterans, come, came to New Orleans. And so they were partying in the streets most of the time. You oh, know, my anyway. God. But, uh, you know, my father... <clears throat> endeared himself to the to the fans of New Orleans because they had a game in New York. They were playing one of the New York teams and one of the Saints wide receivers caught the ball or interception. Something happened on the on the opposite sidelines and the guy was running down the sidelines heading for a touchdown and <clears throat> somebody on the other <laughs> team sideline clotheslined the guy while he was running during oh the game. Oh my God. Right. So they had a big bench clear, and my father ran over there and grabbed the guy, and he's like, you SOB, you know, after the game, I'm coming after you. So, uh, yeah, so after the game, the, the camera pans in on my father, and he beelines across the field. No way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And start mailing. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, they had a big oh fight. Yeah, God. a big fight. And uh, and so you know, all the New Orleans people loved that. And uh, and they tried to raise. And so my father got fined for it. And so they uh, they the fans wanted to send money in to pay for my father's. No fine, way. Right? That's awesome. And the NFL said, no, that's illegal. You can't do that. So uh, they started the Touchdown Club of New Orleans. No. You know, and so made it a, a, made it a charity thing. So that, and so the Touchdown Club's, you know, 50 years old, 53 uh, years old now. So that's you know, great. That action led to a, 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 a good, uh, you know, company that, that does a lot of, for, the, for the community. That's terrific. Wow, that's awesome, yeah. man. That's so it was, you know, it was good growing up in New Orleans, you know, with that. My father's name was known. Stonebreaker's a, a pretty recognizable name. So, uh, you know, I, we had a pretty uh, charmed life growing up. All right. So, so not that your dad made the name up, but what's the origin? I mean, that's, that is the best football name. It's even better than Dick Buckets, man. Stonebreaker as a linebacker. I mean, that's a great name. But I'll go out even now. I go to the store, you know, and, and give you a credit card or you know whatever. God's like Stonebreaker. <laughs> like, oh, you know that's a hell of a name, Stonebreaker. What are you? You know, I'm like, you know, so my response is is the same every time. Like, yeah, but you got to back it up. You know, <laughs> <laughs> people are gonna expect something when 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 they hear that name. So, you know, I don't. It's a we're old Prussian uh, roots. You know, maybe German von Steinbricker or something. Uh, okay. That's what it is. Nice, nice. Well, I, I can't imagine with your your daughters having a the last name too, having to go to the store and see how that is. So, yeah, but but I have to get soften up their names. So I've got Savannah and Violet <laughs> and Victoria <laughs> and Genevieve trying to soften up the the stonebreaker on the back end. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, so now you mentioned LSG. You mentioned your coaches are really involved. Uh, bringing back some, some, some great information for you guys. When you were, so now you were Holtz's, you were in Holtz's first class in 86. So right. were, were there other schools looking at you? Um, what was that process? Did Holtz come to your house or how did that go down? Uh, <clears throat> in 86, I went to visit, my official visit, I went to Texas A&M, UCLA, LSU, and Notre Dame. And I went to Texas A&M, got there at a uh, got there at midnight on a on a Friday night, and the, the whole campus is shut down. The whole city shut down, <laughs> so I wasn't gonna go there. I went to UCLA. I went out to LA. Um, those kids all had condos facing the water. <laughs> I'm looking around. I'm like, I, my dad and I are on the trip. I'm like, man, I love this place. I'm coming here. And I told the guy, I said, look, I really like it here. You know, in my mind, I'm vision, I'm out in LA, I'm gonna, you know, do all of kinds course. of great things, right? And I said, look, I really like it here. I've got two more trips, but you know, I want to come here, but I'm making my two other trips. Okay, okay, you know. <clears throat> so then I went to LSU and I'd been to the, each weekend been to the LSU games, uh, okay. their home games. And so I was real familiar with the campus. And then I went up to Notre Dame and, uh, before I went up to Notre Dame, UCLA called me and said, oh, we signed the number one linebacker in the state of California. So, you know, you, we, they reneged on my scholarship offer. No, you know? are you serious? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So then it was, it was down to uh, uh, Notre Dame and LSU. Okay. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed uh, both places. The one thing, <clears throat> Kurt Schottenheimer coached at LSU, linebackers at LSU. So he was watching me my senior year. Okay. And, you know, they were recruiting me to go to LSU. Right. Now, he goes up to Notre Dame and right. is coaching linebackers at Notre Dame. So, and Foge Fazio from Pitt was recruiting me, but I had a strong relationship with, with Schottenheimer. Okay. And uh, so I didn't really interact with all. Pete Cal Pete. Uh... Cordelli? Pete Cordelli uh, was recruiting me, but you know I didn't have a lot of too right. much contact. Um, so I think it was Schottenheimer's uh, connection that you know kind of 
I think he sold Notre Dame on me. Okay. All right. And so, you know, it was, it was a, it was a toss up between LSU and Notre Dame and I just chose Notre Dame. Okay. Why? I, I don't, I mean, LSU, now granted you've been there a thousand times, but I can imagine the party scene is not like South Bend, no. but also, I mean, that's your hometown. So you, you may have wanted to get away. Right. Uh, you know, a little bit of both of those things. Uh, I could have stayed at LSU and, and done that. I wanted to get out, you know, take, okay. a, take a challenge. It wasn't any big, crazy, uh, you know, uh, uh, situation on my part. It was just, yeah, I'm going to go to Notre Dame. So did Holt do any magic tricks for you or anything? Or, I mean, did he talk to your parents? I mean, how did that go down? No, he didn't do any magic tricks for me. I don't. I don't know if I met him until maybe. <laughs> a when couple, you got there. Uh, no, I can tell you when I first met him was, uh, you know, the freshmen all show up, right? And so we show up early, and uh, Coach Stewart, George Stewart, he, right. he was kind of like uh, Coach Olson's disciplinarian, uh, right. uh, uh, keep keep everybody in check. Right. And Coach Stewart comes up to me and he's like, Stonebreaker, your hair's a little bit too long. You're going to need to get that haircut. And I said, huh? You're going to need to get that haircut before practice and, you know, in an hour. So I'm like, okay, yes, sir. So I go to the Roxy uh, Barber on campus. I'm like, look, they, want, they told me I have to get my hair cut. I don't want to get my hair cut. I have no desire to get my hair cut. So give me a haircut, but, you know, cut it, but don't make it look like it's cut. So I go to practice. <clears throat> Stonebreaker. No. I said, I got my hair cut. He's like, it's not short enough, son. You need to go. So they made me leave campus right there. Leave practice. You left practice. Yeah. And go back to the, back to the oh same day. Like, God. I guess you gotta take it down. I guess you gotta take it down a little bit further. And I've so, never heard that. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was always on the, you know. On day on one. The, on the edge. On the edge. You know? <laughs> on day uh, one. So that's how I was first introduced to Coach Schultz. Interesting. Interesting. Wow. Okay. So your first year, did you play much? Uh, I mean, special teams or, I mean, you have a who's, like, who was in front of you? Do you remember? Mike Kovaleski was a, a oh, linebacker in front of me. Kovale was him. an awesome, awesome linebacker at Notre Dame. I, uh, halfway through the season, I think we were playing – uh, team from Dallas, MSU. Okay. And uh, the Mustangs. Yes. And uh, they had just come off probation, I think. Right. And Kovo got hurt. I went in. I had ten tackles in the interception. Nice. Right. As a freshman. <laughs> right. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So it's like, wow, you know, oh, I guess you can play a little bit. So the next game, we were playing LSU at home. I mean, at in Tiger Stadium. Okay. Right? And so they're like, Stonebreaker, you're starting. And I'm like, all right, great. So, you know, I'm confident. We had a good week of, of practice. And so we go down to the to, for, <laughs> for the game that weekend. And, you know, my, my, uh, Friends all came up to visit, so I'm, you know, spending a little too much time, you know, not concentrating on the game. And uh, the players come out, the offensive linemen come out, Eric Andelsek and and Clap and all these guys. Stone Rick, you should have never left, you traitor. You should have never left, you know. <laughs> and so I'm lining up, you know what I mean? And, and so play a couple of series, but, you know, my head, for whatever reason, was, I was you know, I wasn't ready at okay. that point, you know, for that game. Right. And uh, so at halftime, I go in and Foge Fazio was like, Stonebreaker, I've never seen someone so red-assed in my life. I can't believe you put that effort out. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So he pulled me and, you know, started uh, somebody else uh, in front of me. And I remember on that, I was so mad at that uh, opening kickoff for the, for the second half. I ran so fast and so hard <laughs> on that opening kickoff. And uh, Sammy, Sammy, uh, Sammy Martin was LSU's really fast uh, guy on the team. Okay. I hit him so hard no okay, on the kickoff. I don't know if he remembers the hit. But <laughs> I, the hit. I hit this. I was so mad. I hit him so hard. The ball went about 40 yards. Oh, my God. Out of bounds. I hit him so hard. And uh, so, you know, I learned a lot 
from that and you know <laughs> took took the necessary steps to not ever not be prepared again. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So we talked a little bit about living in Soren. So freshman year from New Orleans, um, great football family, gets Notre Dame, and it's a little different for you, I'm sure. Um, the, the campus might not be as rambunctious as, let's say, LSU's. Um, how was that experience as a student, kind of walking into Notre Dame your first year? Mm, it, it, there's an adjustment in 1986 coming from New Orleans, where it's a wide open city, you know, and you go into a, a South Bend, Indiana. Uh, at Notre Dame at that time was, I think, the undergraduate for 4,500 undergraduate students. Okay. And so, you know, that's a really small school for a, 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 a college with that world recognition name of Notre Dame. You know, to to go to a school at that size, you know, that's a big high school in 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 some cities. So, right. you know, there's a little bit of adjustment. You know, things you could do in New Orleans. You know, you have to <clears throat> you can't do in South Bend, Indiana. So you have to find other ways. So, you know, it was getting adjusted, spending time in the dorms. Uh, you know, concentrating on football and just you know learning. Uh, uh, you know, the Notre Dame way and, and, and how to adjust and be productive, you know, on campus. It was fun. I enjoyed it. We, I had a lot of fun in Notre Dame. Okay, we are listening to Notre Dame alum and national champion Michael Stonebreaker on the Zorich podcast. Uh, speaking more about kind of the campus, uh, can you share kind of a non-athletic, non-football experience that you enjoyed uh that, that, that kind of meant a lot to you of course as you get older you, you, crazy things kind of become sentimental but did you have one of those <clears throat> at on Notre Dame's campus correct that was a non-football memory uh, a good non-football memory well a, a good thing with my sword bodies I took I took three of my dorm uh mates uh we got in one of the one of the guys' seventy eight Volvo station wagon, and we <laughs> drove from South Bend down to uh, New Orleans for no. the weekend. Really? Yeah, yeah. And so we, somebody, we were all sleeping. Someone went the wrong way, so we wound up like in the in the in the mountains of Tennessee. Oh and my it was a God. It was a Friday night, and we're going. You know, it's just like the movies. You're going down the road, and there was this large fella. At least 580 pounds, you know, in the overalls, and so we're kind of waking up. He's like, "I don't know where we are. I'm gonna pull over here." And we look up and we see these guys just sitting on their trucks on the side of the road. And I'm like, "No, no, no, keep going, keep going. We'll, we'll get home." Now, I would have been okay, but it, you know, they were a regular students, so I didn't really have a lot of backup. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we had, but we got to, we made it to New Orleans fine, and we had a lot of fun. So I'm sure they, they, they probably had the best time of their life. I mean, kind of going back with you and kind of enjoying New Orleans and then having to, having to go back, they probably weren't, weren't happy about that. Yeah, it was a good experience to, you know, for them to be able to experience New Orleans. And, and you know, I'd already done everything twice in New Orleans at that point, so I, I knew where to take them. Okay, so this is, you've, you've had a very interesting college career. You kind of – you played a couple of years, you didn't play. The ones you played, you were All-American. So can you kind of walk us through a couple of those years and kind of, unfortunately, what may have happened and kind of the success you may have learned from that? Mm. Or what you learned from that? <clears throat> my sophomore year. Which is my freshman year. Which is your freshman year. Correct. That spring, the spring uh, practice before – we went through spring ball. I was the most improved linebacker. I'm the starting linebacker going in. They recommended, oh, I'm going to go to uh, summer school to take a couple classes to ease your uh, class load in the fall so okay. you can uh, concentrate a little bit more on football. So you take a class or two, and you only have to take three or four, you know. And uh, so I took uh, sociology class, and I took statistics class okay. and the night before the statistics exam 
I was in Wisconsin at a jet <laughs> ski contest. Uh, oh and God. somebody in my group, the police were looking for, and I was hiding in the water up to my up to my head in the water, and like for like forty five minutes, so they wouldn't connect me with this group. And so, you know, it was some decisions like that. I wasn't fully focused. Now, my great, so I didn't do well on my, um, <laughs> statistics, <laughs> my <laughs> statistics test, needless to say. Now, I finished with like a 1.95 grade point average. Now, the NCAA, you had to have a 1.6 or a 1.75. At Notre Dame, you had to but have a 2.0. Right, exactly. And so I was below the 2.0 um, grade point average. So I said, are you, well, you can't represent the university uh in athletics because you don't meet our academic standards and so you know that was really difficult right and well but nothing you, also considering nothing you, you were but but also i mean you, you're going into the season as a starter right right and so you know i'd never failed before at anything and never been set back like that so you know i sat and i was you know I, what do you do you have to accept it and you move on. So I was, uh, I didn't have to go to practice. I well, didn't, well, all right. uh, did, did you ever think about leaving? I mean, were you that pissed or? No. Okay. No, I, I, it was my fault. I was pissed at myself. Okay. Um, and Wisconsin, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I sat out the whole year. I didn't have to go to practice. I didn't eat with the team. I was a, you know, a, a Notre Dame student for the whole year. So. While you you know you guys were off doing the football thing, I was hanging out with this, having the student life, and so it was really great. You know, I made a lot of great friends, and and I did that for the whole year. I didn't have to travel with the team, so all you guys would leave town. So I had the campus, you know, all to myself. So I I, I do remember running into you a couple of times in the dorm and thinking, hey, you know, why is this guy not playing? And then all of a sudden, I heard that you're this this unbelievable, amazing linebacker, and I'm like, damn. Yeah, so I would tailgate. I I was able to go to all the tailgaters <laughs> at Notre Dame. So y'all y'all didn't get to experience the before game tailgating and all the way through until after your careers, and uh, and yeah, a lot of the young guys that came in, uh, you know, maybe would see me around and wait. Uh, some people acted towards me and then these guys, you know, who's this kid? You know, this right. guy's nothing. And uh, had a, a couple minor, you know, not scuffles, but kind of like guys, you know, like uh, uh, showing off a little bit. Sure. And, you guys know, I had to and stuff. test me, right. And I had to walk away from it, right. And it wasn't until practice, you know, in that spring when we put the pads on, and we started playing, and they're like, oh, oh. So was, hey, Stoney, oh, I feel like that. I didn't know it was like that. I'm like, yeah, it's like that, man. That's how it is, right? And so that kind of uh, straightened some things out real quick. So I could remember, man, and it, it, was, it was the best, man, because um, for some, I, I, I still thought I was a linebacker at heart, even though I got moved to, to, to nose guard. And I remember after each game, our stats would come out, and I'd be pissed because I'd always be behind you. And I don't know if you remember this, but we always had this thing when we were playing, like to kind of just to get like a, a fake tackle, you'd, you'd wait until whoever the last person that got up was the guy who was going to get credit for the tackle. You remember this? Yeah. No, you would wait. <laughs> know, Not right? everybody else. No, you would wait. So we're on the bottom, <laughs> we're on the bottom of the pile and you're like, get up. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, you're on top of me. The running back's on top of me. I got him on the ground. You're like, get up. I'm like, you get up. You're like, no, you get up. And I'm like, no, you get up. And the running back's looking at me. And you're like, what the heck is wrong with you? Guys? And uh, you and I sat there for like 30 seconds. You know, and, and, and that's what I tell people, you know, about that defense and how good that defense was, is that most of the time we were competing with each other to get to the ball carrier first. Right. Like, I know that you and I, going down the line, we'd be pushing one another, you know, not out of the way, but pushing one another into right. the right spot or right. aiding one another or, come on, Chris, get out of my way, you know, and I'm sliding, sliding over the back of you. 
And, you know, we really enjoyed that competitiveness to try to get to the ball. It doesn't matter what the offense was running. We were trying to knock that guy out. Right, right. And, I mean, it was so enjoyable because, I mean, I remember, man, I, used to, we, I was laughing and stuff like that. And, I mean, we would talk so much shit. And, I mean, I remember it was crazy because, I mean, then you had somebody like uh, Pat Terrell who, you know, he'd come make a play or, you know, he'd do something. And he's like, I got you, Joker. And I remember looking at him, what the hell are you talking about, Joker? Like, give me a, give me a, give me a curse word or something, man. <laughs> right. Pat, Pat, one time we were playing uh, one of the Air Force, uh, one of the Army uh, uh, teams. Okay. And, and, uh, and uh, they ran like a dive, right? But they, they ran the option. So it was a dive. So Pat comes, sl- you know, I slide to the left. Pat comes slamming. <laughs> It was a dive, but it was a fake, and it was a pass to the tight end, right? So Pat's biting on the dive. So I'm turning to go to the tight end, and Pat runs into me as hard as he can. Oh and so God. I you know, was able to slide off of him and run and dive and barely tip the guy's shoe, or he would have gone, you know, 70 yards for a touchdown. I turn out and say, Pat, don't worry about anything up here. See all this <laughs> stuff up here? I got everything up here, right. man. You, you're you're a right. safety, man. Worry about everything back there. It was funny. But I uh, – I think that's what kind of what you're referring to. I mean, we were, we were so competitive and like, I mean, I, I would, I would get pissed when you, when you'd make the tackle before I would. And, you know, it was just one of those things where, cause I remember every time the stat list came out, I mean, normally your linebackers are supposed to make all the tackles. And then after that, you, your defensive backs and then third is supposed to be linemen. But I remember I used to kind of get in the top three every once in a while. And, you know, I, I wanted to get to that number one or number two, but I, I could never do it because, you know, it was either you or somebody else out there making all the tackles. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to be, Chris. No, no. You can't go out there thinking you were going to make more tackles than me. Yeah, yeah, I can. I, can. I mean, you can strive for that. <laughs> but just, I think you understood that that was never going to happen. All right, so I talked to a bunch of people about this, and the, the one question that I asked a lot of the guys, out, and I don't know, maybe Miami wasn't your favorite game, but do you have a a game the the year we won the national championship that kind of stands out for you, or was it like something special for you? Uh, not an individual game. Okay. You know, I think it was with the start of the season, you know, in my mind, you know, and I think you have to be this way as a football player. If you don't think you're the best player on the field, then you don't need to be out there, right? right. If you don't want to make every single tackle, then you don't, you shouldn't be on the field. Um, you know, and so, and you want to win every game. Right. And so I remember when we said we were joking around, the offense would come off and like, good job, Tony. Nice, nice interception. <laughs> <laughs> as, as he's running off the field. Right, yeah, great right, job. Right. You know, <laughs> good job, Ricky. Nice fumble. You know what I mean? Right, right. Uh, but it was an opportunity for us to get back on the field. And so we right. appreciated that. You know, even if it was on the 15 yard line, we were going to shut them down. Right. And so, right. so those are the things that I remember and admire. It, was, it wasn't an individual game, it was, you know, the collectiveness of the group of guys we had and, you know, we trained together and, and, you know, put a lot of time in at practice and put a lot of time working out. People don't understand, you know, you, you get better in January, February, March, April, you know, exactly. after that, after that, if you haven't done it in those months, you, right. then you're not going to have a shot. And so, you know, when you, when you have a group of people that are sacrificing for the common goal, come together and you're able to play at that high level that we were playing, then, you know, that was a joy that I had, you know, I would get nervous before every game. You know, I had, I would have to take the modal, you know, help you not go to the bathroom. I'd be so <laughs> nervous before every game because I, you know, I wanted to perform very well after that first play, then you, I could not wait to get back on the field. And so it was that feeling throughout the whole season. Is just wanting to be on the field, wanting to make plays, wanting to be out there for each other and, uh, you know, come out as champions in the end. And on top of that, being at Notre Dame, you know, my 
three years at Notre Dame. So then you understand, you know, how important that season was to bring Notre Dame back to the top of college football was, was something really special. Right. And, you know, I met this kid the other day, you know, LSU kid around here. He's like, oh, I heard you play football. I'm like, yeah, you know, a little bit back in the, you know, in the old days. And he's like, you know, where would you play? I'm like, Notre Dame. He's like, you know what? You know, I mean, I hate to say this, but, you know, I hate Notre Dame. I said, that's fine. I said, you can hate Notre Dame. I said, but when I was playing, it was, we were rolling on everybody. <laughs> and, and the more you hated, the more we were going to roll on you. So, you know, that's the mindset that I have. And so... Well, although you didn't say this, um, I do remember a great game you had that I think you single-handedly beat Michigan State on your own. Uh, I know you had a a was it an interception for a touchdown or was it a fumble? No, it wasn't a fumble. It was an interception, right? Uh, two interceptions, Chris. Sorry, return sorry. return return one foot touchdown. Okay, sorry. and I had 19, 19 tackles. <laughs> now the first interception was at the end of the first half, and it was just a deflection <laughs> that fell into my hands. And so I'm running with it up the sidelines, and this big offensive lineman's coming at me, and George Streeter was right behind me. He gave it to George at the last second, and that big offensive lineman just wiped out George's heart. No, so, oh, yeah, I set okay. him up. It wasn't a good. Set <laughs> All right, okay, well, tell us about the next one. And the next one, it was a, maybe a man defense, and the guy threw it right to me, and I ran it in for a touchdown. And, and if I don't – I forgot the score of the game, but you, would you happen to remember – I mean, you, you actually you, – if not for you, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have won the game. Well, I know that's that. most, of, most of the games that we played. You can probably go. put Here under that umbrella. Here we but go. But for that individual game, yes, it helped. It didn't seal it. Like, it wasn't a last-second thrilling win, but – it gave us a cushion at that time. We are talking to the Michael Stonebreaker, for, former uh, Notre Damer and national champion on the Zorich podcast. So now for me, the, the, the last game against West Virginia, I mean, I kind of knew going into it what we we're going to do. And, and I, I'd like to know you're feeling like it was, it was almost anticlimactic for me at least, but I mean, how did you, I mean, that was the game we won it. So how did you feel about the fact that, Hey, we have a chance to, to win the national championship. And it was kind of like, uh, I mean, we knew, we knew we were, yeah, we knew we were going to win because the big game, you know, the four or five big games we had that year, but we had just come off of Notre Dame SC. number one, USC right. number two. You know, so that was the biggest game in the country, maybe, you know, in the last 10 years. Right. In the Coliseum, sold out, you know, full. And, uh, you know, that was the big game. And so now, you know, you want to give West Virginia credit and they were a good squad and everything, but we had all the confidence in the world after that. And so it was just a matter of going out and executing and, 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 you know, breaking them down and, and getting the win. So do you remember, I don't remember this, um, maybe because I got hit in the head too many times, I'm not sure, but somebody told me that we had, we had a, a team mass after the national championship game. Do you remember that? Like, like we, it was back at the hotel. I do not. Like, like somebody, if somebody kind of walked me through it, I was like, yeah, it was like you were there. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I think we were more. We, everyone's minds was probably already <laughs> celebrating in another venue where you did want to give praise, right? And and thanks for that, you know, accomplishment. But uh, those got overlooked a little bit. Okay, give me now. You talked about your freshman year with uh with the haircut. Uh, can you give us a, a whole story later on? in your Notre Dame career that you remember? It could be interesting or it could be maybe not interesting. Mm, I'll give you a personal one. Uh, that's, that's I, came back, I came back for my fifth year okay. of football. And we had, you know, uh, Barry Alvarez that had left to, and gone to Wisconsin. We all right. loved Barry and it's enjoyed playing with Barry. We had a new defensive coordinator. And so we're going out to the uh, practice field the first day and he, he's also the linebackers coach. 
he looks at me and tells me, uh, I'm not afraid to start a freshman. And so, you know, I looked at him and I'm like, you know, what? okay, you know, like, it's going to be like that, right? <laughs> and so that's how, that's how we went out to practice the first day. Oh, my God. And, and so, you know, uh, he instilled his defense, and we all played uh, the correct gap control defense that he taught us. And the Michigan game, they came out and ran for 289 yards on us. Now, everybody was in their gap. Everybody was filling the gap like they were supposed to. <laughs> and, you know, but actually during that game, I think I was able to intercept a, a ball on the touchdown and seal again, that uh, game for us. Jesus. Okay, uh, thanks, Mike. And, 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 well, I'm just saying. And then the next week, we were playing Michigan State, and it's the fourth quarter, and he pulled me out of the game, and I'm on the sidelines during the fourth quarter, and the guys are looking at me like, you know, what's going on? And I'm like, I have no idea. Because, wow. you know, in my mind, I was, you know, I, I was flabbergasted why I wasn't. So after practice, like after practice on, we won that game, I think, yeah. And after practice, I uh, went, I, put, I said, Coach, I need to talk to you, Coach Holtz. And I'd never, you know, pulled him aside to talk to him about playing my, my entire time there. And I'm like, Coach, I came back for my fifth year to play football. I said, I didn't come back to stand on the sidelines in the fourth quarter uh, in a close game. You know, I'm confident in my building that, you know, I'm going to be able to make a play and do something to help change the way the outcome of the, of, of the game is going. But, you know, I was standing on the sidelines and, you know, I don't know why. And he said, oh, Michael, he said, I didn't know that. He said, I'm going to check into it. I said, all right, thanks. So the next week, I think he pulled the defensive controls away from our defensive coordinator. And the next week, we were playing Tennessee. And Tennessee, the defense had like 89 or 90 something snaps. And I was on the field the whole time. And I'm like, hey, I need a breather. I was trying to get a breather. And they're like, no, you stay out there. I'm like, okay. You know? And so, you know, so that's my Lou Holtz story. And that, that, that wonderful defensive coordinator we had um, senior year was uh, Gary Darnell, if, that, if I remember correctly. Is that true? Correct. Yes. yes. The one who said that he's not afraid to start a freshman. Start a freshman. That's, yeah. Wow. That's really, really interesting. Um, so during your time there, um, I, I know how important Roger Valdestri was to me. But before I met him, uh, my understanding is that you had a relationship with him as well. Um, and for those of you who might not know, Roger Valdestri was the sports information director at Notre Dame for like, 500 years. He still lives in the South Bend area. He's literally like the man who's credited to like creating that industry. He, he's like the grand, the godfather of Sports Info. And he's also the one who changed Joe Theismann's name to Thiesman during his senior year. So kind of get it, get it to sound like Theismann. Or Thiesman, wait, backwards. Thies Thiesman Thies to Theismann. Correct. Um, Yes, and so Roger was all of those things that you said, and he was also uh, a really a nice person. And so he was a person that you could go and talk to. You know, he was a person that you would, you know, you could go up to sports information and hang out, you know, spend time with him, see him outside of the building, spend time with him. Uh, he was always conscious about you know, the NCA regulations and rules, you, you couldn't go in the car with them or, you know, go to dinner, but you could, you know, meet at dinner and, you know, make sure we didn't cross any boundaries. But he was a guy that was always, you know, there for you as a person, make sure, you know, checking on you, make sure you're okay, uh, you know, would do anything in the world for you and just a really beautiful human being. And, and I think, I think it was your, your freshman year when his wife passed away. Right. right. His wife passed. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and, and that's a sad thing. And Roger has uh, five kids. Yeah. I think so. And um, everyone was, was older and, you know, out of the house and in professional careers. And so, you know, it was, I think Roger needed that. And, you know, he could tell that, you know, uh, I needed, you know, some, uh, a companion or, you know, some, some little bit of stability in my life to, to keep me focused. So, you know, uh, 
at all, you know, all the ups and downs and everything I went through at Notre Dame, Roger was always there 100% for me. Well, I, I do have to, and obviously you had a, a, a great relationship with him. I did as well, but um, I always remember he taught me how to tie a tie. And, and I know that's kind of a weird thing. I mean, I, we, I had tons of dinners over there with him, and, and, and I know there's a lot of guys over there and stuff like that. But I remember the, the one thing I never knew how to tie a tie. And, you know, for me, uh, not having a dad, um, he was kind of that person that – I could go to when, you know, things weren't that going that great for me in school. Um, I remember uh, he accompanied me to the, uh, the, the Lombardi ceremony, uh, both my junior and senior year. Um, I wanted Winnie at my, my, my senior year. And I could remember uh, as soon as I got off the stage, uh, and I think there were cell no, 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 I think there were cell phones back then. But I remember after I got off the stage, um, we had went over by the phone banks and he was like, hey, Chris, come here. And I was kind of like, dude, I just won this award. Like, you know, I mean, like, you know, everybody's pat me on my back and stuff like that. And you want me to talk on the phone? I'm like, who is this host? And it was my mom. And like, I, you know, I mean, Rod was just an amazing, amazing person, but I think it's amazing, or I think it's unfortunate because uh, a lot of kids nowadays um, don't have some, because it, it, maybe it's more so time. Um, they're, they got so much other stuff going on. But I mean, we, we like proactively, like I remember jumping in people's cars, like going over to Roger's house and him making a big old huge uh, bowl pasta of pasta dinner. and yeah. everybody laying out in the living room, relaxing. TV. Laughing and having a good time. Yeah. I mean, that's how, you know, and he was that with a lot of people and he didn't, you know, overtly, you know, try to be that with everyone. That's just who he was. Right. And those are the relationships that, that, that he had and that he developed. And, you know, that's why he's such a, a, a beautiful uh, soul. You know, and it's so interesting because like when you think of, you know, all the figures that Notre Dame has to offer, I mean, I, I was never like that with Holtz. Um, you know, I was never like that with my position coach. I was never like that with, with anyone else except him. And, you know, I don't know if it was that demeanor. I mean, he was like four foot nothing. And, you know, he would just come up to you. And I remember the first loss we had our senior year, your, your fifth year, you know, it was against uh, Stanford. And I refused to talk to the media. And he, he grabbed me and was like, hey, Chris, you know, they want you outside. And I'm like, I'm not going. And it's like, this is the first time he ever yelled, like, well, yelled at me. But he yelled at me and gave me, like, this big lecture about, you know, one, you know, it's fine that you can go out there and talk when you're winning. Anybody can do that. You know, it's, you, you're a man when you can stand up there and talk about a loss. And I was just like, oh, my. And here's Roger, who's, like I said, four foot nothing. This man I love, he's yelling at me. And I was like, oh, my God. I, I'll never forget that. I went out there and I talked. But, I mean, he was, he is, you know, just a, an amazing, amazing man. Yeah, I agree. We are talking to Michael Stonebreaker, Notre Dame alum and national champion. Uh, we're going to transition a little bit to uh, your becoming a pro. Um, we actually were – I'm the Bears together for a little bit. Um, <laughs> yes, we were. I think I, I sent you that photo uh, maybe a couple months ago. I was actually going through some stuff, and they called us Baby Bears. Baby Bears. Yeah. Chris and I, you and I roommate on the road, on the road trips also. And so we were, we were stuck together. But, I mean, and that's what I kind of enjoyed the most was the fact that, like, I mean – for me, selfishly, I was a hometown kid. I had you from Notre Dame. I mean, I, it was a blast. Yeah, it was, it was good. I mean, People were asking me. I didn't play at all. Right, right. I was like 20, you know, what, 24, 25 years old with a pocket full of money living in Chicago, playing for the Bears. You know, the Chicago, the sports town of Chicago with the Blackhawks and the, the Cubs and the White Sox and the, and the uh, Chicago Bears and the Bulls. I'm like, are you kidding me? There's not a bigger sports town in the country. And so I couldn't have been happier. And, you know, we were able to, to uh, 
uh, you know, Tom Thayer from Notre Dame was all starting up. offensive guard, right? So you had, you know, I went out a little bit more than you did, I think, but um, <laughs> you had uh, Tom Thayer and, uh, uh, you know, the offensive line, and they had all just won uh, uh, Jay Hilgenberg and those guys that all just won a Super Bowl a couple of years earlier. So, you know, they had that city wired. And, uh, you know, we were, a, I was, we were able to, Tail coat those guys and 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 reap some good benefits from that. So you know, it absolutely. Was awesome, and I remember, Tom, awesome. did you live with Tom? Didn't Tom? I like, did live with. Yeah. I did live with Tom. Which which is just the type of guy he is. You know, I mean, I mean, I, I remember meeting him when we were playing and stuff at Notre Dame. But you know, you fast forward a couple years, and you know, all of a sudden he's like, yeah, you know, come hang out. I mean, but, but that's just the kind of guy he is. Yeah, Tom's awesome, and you know, yeah. When I was up there on campus, he, he's like, "Where are you living?" Oh, I'm gonna get a place. I'll like, oh, just come stay at my place. And so, you know, Tom's Mister Chicago. He could be the mayor of Chicago, right? He does everything right in Chicago, and they love him there. And he's doing an awesome job uh, with the broadcasting. And he's always been a great person and a great friend. Yeah, and and he he almost looks as good as you do, because he's down to like I think he's over 200 pounds. And I think you may be just hitting over 200 pounds an hour. Well, well I had to gain weight. I had to eat. I had to gain about eight, seven or eight pounds because I got down to 200. And it hadn't been 200 since I was like, a, <laughs> like eighth grade or high school. Yeah, yeah. And so I looked at it. I was like, 200. I'm like, I need to start eating a little more carbs here because I eliminate all those carbs out of my diet. So. Okay. So good, for 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 those, not that you would know this, but. Um, as a lineman, you know, it's kind of hard to lose weight sometimes. And about a year ago, maybe about a year and a half, eh, maybe about a year ago, um, Mike and I were on the phone talking. And in the week, we kind of talked to each other randomly about various things. And I don't even know how we got on the subject. But my wife had been telling me to try this keto diet forever. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I can't eat bread, can't, no, no, it's not gonna happen, not gonna happen. And then somehow you and I got on it. I got on the conversation. And I and sold then, you on it. I you sold did. you on it quick. You did. I mean, I had you, you sent me. I had you Googling things uh, uh, <laughs> right after you hang up the phone. Up the I phone. bought some cookbooks. <laughs> and literally within maybe, I'd say, month, month and a half after that, I'd lost like 15, 20 pounds. And I lost a total of 30. And so every now and then, Mike kind of sends me photos of him in clothes, thank God. But... um at 200, I, I, I don't know if I've seen the photo at 200, so thanks for not, for not sending that one. Yeah, my sister was like, oh, are you lose some weight? Maybe, maybe that's enough. Huh? I'm like, yeah, I'm up <laughs> a little bit. My head looked like the Macy's Day uh, parade <laughs> float. <laughs> if you don't know that, I do have a large cranium. I, I was actually going to say that. So what's, you were like a... Is there a nine, ten size helmet? Like, no, it's like uh, an what? eight. And it, I went there. There's a hat shop down here in New Orleans. Like, <laughs> I need to. I need to go to the big boy shop. He's like, <laughs> he, put, he went and got one. He's like, all right, you can come in the back. So he brought me to the back <laughs> to the special drawer, like down below. And they had some big monster buckets back there. I was able to purchase. So you wore an eight. Not, again, not the way anybody wants to know this. But you wore like an eight, eight and a half, right? Helmet. Yes. Yes. Hey, the the, the normal size. For helmet is like seven and three four, or you know, seven and a fourth or something like that, right? Yeah. yeah. So you, I you, found I found a note. I found a my mother's sick, so the, my sisters are sending photos, right? So she sent a group of photos and a letter I had written to my mother, right, from when I was a young kid visiting Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, uh, my grandmother lived in uh, at Colonial Williamsburg. Okay. And so. The first sentence of the uh, letter says, hi, mom, I went on a tricorn hat tour. I bought a hat, in parentheses, it was too small. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> even at, you know, seven, eight years old, those tricorn hats, uh, I couldn't get one big enough to fit my Oh, my head. God, that's hilarious. Well, for some people, it wasn't really hilarious for me. <laughs> uh, um, I am, and I also started to hear about the, your, your mom's not doing well. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's all right. We um, so after the Bears, uh, you, you played for a couple more teams and you, you wound up ending up in New Orleans. What was that like? 
playing in your home? I mean, I know how it was for me, but what was it like for you? It was fun. You know, I bounced around a little bit. And so being back in New Orleans, my father had played, uh, you know, with the Saints. And so, you know, to be able to wear a jersey with Stonebreaker on the back and, you know, have those hanging side by side was pretty awesome. Uh, it was a short-lived, maybe I only played five games okay. with the Saints. And then Jim Moore came and said, um, we're going to let – they got me out of the defensive uh, linebacker meeting. He said, we're going to let you go to bring, on, bring in a backup offensive lineman. <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, I guess my career is up. I guess the writing's on the wall, right? And so, you know, at that point – you know, it was an uphill battle and, and, you know, I wasn't in the right mindset to, you know, keep chasing the dream. I had other okay. things going on. Um, but, you know, being from New Orleans and, and being a, a, a New Orleans kid, it was pretty awesome, man. Nice. And then after uh, New Orleans spent a little bit in the World League or was that before? Uh, that was before. Oh, okay. All right. What was that like? It was fun. Uh, I played for the Frankfurt Galaxy. Okay. And uh, we won the World Bowl. Nice. And uh, Paul Justin was our quarterback. Oh, there you go. Holy crap. Wow. He played with the Bears. Yeah. Miller, Jim Miller was our quarterback. Didn't he play for the Bears? Yeah, also? absolutely. Yeah. And uh, uh, Tom Cavallo was a running back. I mean, linebacker. Um, it was fun. We had a lot of fun. You know, Honestly, we were in Frankfurt, Germany. There was a, a bar that sold beer, you know, <laughs> right behind the hotel. And so you're in Germany, <laughs> you drink beer. So every day after practice, we just go back there and drink beer and then go go to sleep and wake up and go to practice. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, but we were able to, you know, we drove to France one weekend. We had a weekend okay. off. You know, we played in, in Spain and England and uh, Amsterdam and another town and Rhine, uh, Germany, and so, you know, Scotland we played, and uh, so it was awesome being able to uh, travel around and, and for free and get that experience. It was a lot of fun, and the guys were a lot of fun. So was it a situation where, like, you guys were just there for the season, and then everybody for, came back, or? Everybody came back after the game. Okay. After the final game that we played, we got on a plane and flew back to the United States. Oh, wow. Oh, like that? The, yeah, it was that quick. Wow. And we had been in Amsterdam. The final was played in Amsterdam. And so we threw, flew from Amsterdam back into the United States. So we were going through customs and all these kids had been in Amsterdam and they were, oh my God. Or, or not, they or not. <laughs> they were, were, or not, were, maybe not, had things in their bags and the dogs were walking around <laughs> sniffing, you know. Oh my God. Even whatever was left over, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was funny. Guys were that is crazy. hilarious, man. So did you ever feel like, like when you said kind of the, the when Jim Moore told you about that, I mean, did you ever feel like, you know, hey, I don't want this to be over. You know, I'm going to go try some more. I'm going to go try to try out for another team. I mean, how was kind of walking away for you? Mm -hmm. At that point, after New Orleans, I knew that mentally I was done. Okay. Because, you know, I knew the type of player I am. And, and you know, I think that I needed support and trust. And, you know, I, there was, wasn't that opportunity. Like, I never played, you know, 50 snaps in between the tackles. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so that's where I lived. That's where right. I was comfortable in between right. the tackles. Right. And so I just, you know, running down on, on special teams and all that and, you know, lining up over a tight end, that uh, is not my strength with lining up over a tight end. Right. And so, you know, they had Sam Mills in New Orleans. You had Singletary in Chicago. And, you know, so, it was, you know, one of those things where I just don't – never had the opportunity to prove myself on the field, and I'm fine with that. And so – you know, I was mentally, I was done uh, with football. And so I drove around and drove to uh, Tampa and hung out with Tim Ryan. I drove to Miami uh, and hung out is with that, Is that when he had the motorcycle or not? That was when he had the okay, motorcycle. Yes. Yeah. Not about you? Uh, yes, it was. Okay. I drove the motorcycle around. Uh, then I just drove to different uh, places around the country for a year and a half or two and 
and hung out and, uh, you know, made that transition out sure. of the mindset of, you know, trying to be, you know, what we were back then, you know, you, you trained yourself to, in my mind, I was an assassin, right? I was a knockout artist, right? That's the mindset we had back then. So, you know, you, you have to learn how to be, get through that and get right. beyond that mindset. And so that always takes a little bit of adjustment. Which is interesting because a lot of folks don't necessarily talk about that. And, and that's, uh, it, 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 could, it could either go good or bad. Um, you know, we've all heard stories about uh, people who have issues with, with that. Um, but it sounds like you're able to make that transition as you're driving across country in your own version of Easy Rider. So, Well, sure. It took a little bit longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still processing things today, right? <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so, <clears throat> oh, go ahead. Good. Uh, tell us about No Brew, what you're doing now. No Brew, I've been making cold drip coffee for the last 15 years. What is so cold no drip brew, coffee? So No Brew coffee is cold. When you cold drip coffee, it leaves 70% of the bitter acids in the beans. So it's a lot smoother tasting cup of coffee. I didn't know that. And so we started doing this 15 years ago. And uh, you when we bottle, it's a refrigerated product. We bottle it and you sell it in grocery stores. And it's got a, it's a little bit of a concentrate. So you use one part coffee to two parts milk or water oh, wow. okay. over ice or you heat it up, you know, and you add whatever sugars, sweeteners you like or don't like in it. So it's customizable, you know, to everyone's uh, in taste. And so 50 years ago, we'd go to the, you know, dairy section of the grocery stores and nobody knows what it is. They're like, cold coffee. I don't, I don't drink no cold coffee. And, you know, talk to some angel investors, you know, I remember this one guy vividly, he was from uh, Dunkin' Donuts and he actually uh, wasn't a, a, a friend of a Notre Dame alum, right? And he's like, well, let me get this guy. He's, he's the expert. And the, and the, the Dunkin' Donuts guy came back to him. Well, they're never, cold coffee's never going to take off. You know, it's not anything. Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wish oh I had that letter. God. I wish I had that letter that that guy sent back then. Wow. Like, he's the expert. Uh, and so, you know, it was, it, was always, it was a hard sell back then. But now, you know, it's an everyday drink. And it's an accepted drink. And you know, everybody's selling uh, cold drip coffee. So it's a good thing because we're, you know, it's not always better to be first to market, you know, because sure. you have to grow that market. So now that there are more uh, uh, products available, you know, we at No Brew are comfortable with our price points and our taste, you know, up against anybody. And so that's what we do. We sell at grocery stores, we sell at coffee shops, we sell, uh, you know, online, uh, at nobrew.com. And I'm sorry, where, where, where was it again? No, nobrew.com. Thank you. And um, is so it that's N what I'm doing. or is it N period O period? Well, officially on the web, it's N O B R E W.com. Okay, thank officially, you. Officially, it's N period O period brew. New okay. Orleans brew, no brew. Gotcha. You don't have to brew it, it's already brewed. And it's delicious. I think it's the best tasting iced coffee out there. Of course you do. <laughs> As you should. And I used to only drink it ice, but the last couple of years, in the mornings, I'll have it. I'll put it in the microwave for, you know, two and a half minutes, pour some milk on it, and I'll have in the morning, I'll have a, a hot coffee, and then in the afternoon, I'll have cold coffee. Nice, nice. So, I mean, when you got into it, was it like, you know, hey, this is a great idea. Did you have to be sold on it? Or was it like, you know, hey, I'm ready to do this entrepreneur thing? I mean, what was that conversation with yourself? Well, I, I, had, uh, I had had my first child, Savannah, and then I had, you know, a little bit of cash left over and I was about to run out of money. And I'm like, all right, I need to do something. So I moved to San Francisco and started a, uh, <clears throat> a franchise out there. I bought a franchise in San Francisco I was in the check guarantee and check verification business. Okay. And so this was in 97, maybe, or 98. Okay. And, uh, and 
So our first client, we had like 250 Pizza Hut locations. So we were calling people <laughs> on the phone. I had like 25 collectors you know, calling people on the phone, beating them up for, you know, $17 bounce pizza checks. And, oh, my God. Yeah, there's a lot of bounce pizza checks out there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I did that for about six or seven years, five or six years. Okay. And then I sold that to my business partner. Um, <clears throat> because I was beating people up for $17 pizza. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, and then, uh, so I hung out in San Francisco for a couple of years after that. And that was the rise and the fall of the dot-com initial. Uh, and so I was ready to get out of um, San Francisco. So Savannah was living back here with her mother. So Kitty and I left San Francisco and moved to New Orleans to be a part of Savannah's life on a daily basis and just stumbled into coffee when I got here and okay. stumbled into on the idea and, you know, had an opportunity and here it is. Nice. Now I've got group. four daughters now and uh, Kitty and I have been together for 22 years, 23 years. How about that? How about that? That's awesome. All right. So, we're going to kind of wind it down a little bit. And I always ask him this question because I'm so fascinated by it. And it's really not that, not that great of a question, but what would a, well, what would the current Mike Stonebreaker tell a 18, 19 year old Mike Stonebreaker at Notre Dame? <clears throat> hmm. Christopher. Okay. Man, I saved the best for well, last. See, right. See, when I was young, I was painfully shy when I was young. And so, which is, which is so not you. So not I'm you. telling you, I've got, I'm telling you, I was painfully shy, right? So, you know, in, in, I could have taken more, uh, you know, been a little more outgoing and, you know, done a little, I, I remember sitting in class, right? I was talking, I remember sitting in class knowing the answer that the teacher was asking, and I could not bring myself to say the answer, you know, really? in the class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sitting there, I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, in, my, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, see, I told you. I knew, the, you know, and just painfully shy. So, you know, just to be a little more, you know, because some people took that as, and I'm deaf in one ear, so, right. you know. I'm not dog, football player. Right, right. Or, you know, he, he doesn't hear you, he can't hear you, he doesn't, uh, you know, respond to you, so. You know, just be a little more outgoing, I guess, on a personal level with people. So, would you say? So, what would you say kind of got you out of that? Oh, out of that shyness. Uh, it's life. You know, going through uh, life, there are still things that make me uncomfortable. Right. Um, like, but, like this interview. No, I love you, Chris. Okay. I can talk okay. to you all day long. Thank you. Um, my in those notes that my mother sent pictures my mother sent there was an right. article from from my high school days right okay and my high school coach said something to the effect of you know uh mike uh you can't get a word out of mike you know he's he's shy you know he likes to tease people but he's always got his mind nothing bothers him you know he's always got his mind on 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 the field and so you know it was one of those things that I grew up with. And so, uh, you know, other than that, we both lived a pretty good life. So I'm All right. happy with it. All right. Well, Mike, thank you so much. Um, this is, uh, it's fun to have a chance to kind of hang out. And I learned, I've learned some things actually. Um, one that you're painfully shy, which I, I don't necessarily agree with because <clears throat> you're not like that around a lot of the guys I know. Um, and having a chance to kind of share some of your stories with the folks who are watching, because I, I always talk about wanting to kind of do something different. Um, we didn't talk a lot of, well, Mike talked a lot about his, his, uh, the games he won for us. Um, but this is not about stats and not about, you know, who scored what touchdown or whatever. I just kind of want to bring something a little, little different to the folks that I know and kind of share stories that kind of really made you the person you are. And, and I think we had a chance to hear some of that. So Michael, thank you very much for 
uh, allowing me to bump you from last week to this week. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. You know, I'm always there for you, buddy. It was fun talking <laughs> to you. And well, hold on. We're done yet. What about last week? Didn't you tell Ty that your class was a class that kind of brought Notre Dame back and, you know, and back into the forefront? And you didn't mention T. Rice and Pat and Stan Smagala and Tim Grunhard and, and uh, who else? <laughs> Who, who I'm, else? Writing down, I'm writing it down. Right. And, and who else were you leaving out? Well, I think when we talked, to, when, I, when, when Todd and I talked about that, it was uh, that era. We didn't necessarily say it was. Uh, old yo, I, I heard you say our class. It was kind of <laughs> our class that brought everybody up. I mean, you forget about the work we put in before you got there, Christopher. You, you know what? You're right. You're right. I apologize about that for those of you who may have listened before when Todd was on. Uh, I do remember saying that we're, we're the ones, we're the class that kind of brought brought folks back. But now, now that now that you, now that you <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there, Chris. That is correct. That is correct. So I, I do apologize to the class of '86. <clears throat> um, well, it was class of night. So I, I do apologize to you guys about that for uh, not acknowledging the fact that you were maybe the flawless. Well, the smallest and most <laughs> dominant class that they've ever had. Yeah, you know, seriously, I mean, you talk about a lot of underachievers. Right. I mean, I, I don't know how, I mean, you had Stan. I mean, come on, right? Well, yeah. outside of John, who, I mean, Foley, who was like, you know, Mr. Mr. USA Today. But USA, other than yeah. that, you know, I mean, there were a lot of people who might not have, you know, I mean, it was, there were a lot of sleepers, let's say. Right. I think that's what it was, was the coaches coming from different areas of the country and had their, their guys, you know what I mean? So at that, during that year, they were able to pull, you know, a few of them in. And I think that's what really solidified that, that year and that team. So you're saying that probably, you know, they weren't necessarily, you guys weren't necessarily on people's uh, kind of recruiting boards. You were just kind of run of the mill average, kind of not really great players that you guys want to, Becoming good, huh? No, that's not what I said, Chris. What I said was <laughs> <laughs> that it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Chris. And, uh, I really appreciate you having me on. Hey, Mike, thank you much, man. I look forward to talking to you soon. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank, obviously, Mike uh, for, again, allowing me to bump him back. Um, also would like to thank my producer, who's also my wife, Candy. Um, who's going to be running into the room any second now. Um, and then also to everyone uh, watching on Facebook Live, this was great. You, you're, you're watching the Zorch Podcast. If for some reason you may have missed anything, you can check this interview and our other interviews on the Zorch Podcast at my YouTube page at ChrisZorch50. Michael, again, thank you very much, and I look forward to talking to you later. Thanks, Chris. Love you, brother. All right, bro. Love you too, man. Bye. Bye.